Welcome to Settle, a wonderful market town located on the southern edge of the legendary Yorkshire Dales. Though only home to around 2,500 people, Settle is one of the largest towns in the region, its market having served as a draw for people from all over the Wild Dales for centuries. Here we're looking at Settle's soaring market cross, erected in the late 19th century, and which stands at the heart of the town's always busy marketplace. Now markets have been held here in Settle for the vast majority of the town's history, possibly since as far back as the year 1249, and today the marketplace is an intriguing blend of old and new, surrounded by two striking buildings. On the eastern side of the marketplace here is the Shambles, which was built around the year 1780 as a row of arcaded shops on the ground floor, as we can see in front, and with a row of cottages on the story above. A fetching edifice that still plays a part in Settle's wonderful range of boutique shopping options, the Shambles is one of just a number of landmarks here at the heart of this town that tells a fascinating story. And speaking of fascinating stories, this house on the northern side of the marketplace was once regularly visited by one of the most famous musicians in British history, Edward Elgar, who stopped off a number of times in his friend's house here while he was in the Yorkshire Dales, a region that is said to have captivated the composer as a young man, and inspired him to write the iconic music so strongly associated with the English countryside. But how exactly does the town of Settle here fit into the legendary landscape of the Yorkshire Dales? Well, as you can see from this map, Settle sits on the very southern edge of the Yorkshire Dales National Park, but it's notably surrounded by hills and crags close to its town centre, while the Yorkshire Three Peaks of Pennygent, Ingleborough and Wernside are just a few miles to the north of the town centre here. But as we pass by the shambles just beside us, Settle's town centre is today rather dominated by another building, the Grand Settle Town Hall built in 1832 as part of the modernisation of the marketplace here, and which was also designed as a venue for market stalls, as well as a library, bank and public lecture room. The grand town hall before us is now home to more permanent shops, but temporary market stalls are still raised on Settle's Marketplace every Tuesday, turning the heart of this town into one of the busiest hubs of activity for miles around. And another place that you'll often see busy with people is the memorably named pub just across the road from the marketplace, The Old Naked Man, a locally run cafe and bakery much loved by residents and visitors alike. One of the many listed buildings surrounding Settle's marketplace, The Old Naked Man began life in the 19th century as a simple house, but it was later converted into a cafe and named after this unusual figure which adorns its facade. But the so-called naked man on the building isn't actually naked at all. In fact, he's wearing a buttoned tunic that's thought to have been a deliberate way for the house's former owner to poke fun at Settle's community of Quakers, noted for their simple clothing in contrast to the Anglicans of the local area. We'll talk more about Settle's Quakers in a couple of minutes when we visit the town's delightful meeting house. But while the legacy of the naked man may have initially been a form of light-hearted mockery, Today, the cafe is a wonderful institution that gives us an intriguing window into Settle's past. Now, we're going to make our way off the marketplace and take a stroll down this fetching little alleyway, which is home to some of the oldest buildings in the modern town. In fact, some of the houses that we're walking past now date from as far back as the 1650s, constructed from the distinctive stone mined in the quarries of the Yorkshire Dales and the buildings have in the past served as everything from simple residences to grocers' shops and more, albeit in what was a decidedly cramped area of town, with only small lanes running between the buildings. Centuries ago, when Settle was a smaller but no less bustling hub of activity for the local region, the town was characterised by narrow lanes and courts reminiscent of those you'd find off the high street in nearby Skipton. But over the last couple of hundred years, efforts have been made to modernise the town, with the advent of tourism giving birth to many delightful new cafes and shops, and bringing in a new form of wealth to the town. Nowadays, while Skipton is very much the gateway to the Yorkshire Dales, Settle here is the perfect place to base yourself if you're spending an extended period of time in this famously picturesque part of England not only because it's a place with so much wonderful scenery surrounding it, but because there's also a wealth of things to do in the town besides hiking, 
and it's especially convenient too, owing to its rail links with major cities in the north of England, which we'll talk about later when we visit Settle's gorgeously preserved Victorian railway station. But speaking of well-preserved Victorian buildings, here on the street known as Kirkgate, we find ourselves passing by Victoria Hall, built in 1853 and which stands as one of the oldest music halls still standing in Britain. And the building is still used today as an important social and cultural centre for the local region. Music halls were of course a vital part of local life in towns up and down the country in the 19th and first half of the 20th century. And the construction of one here in Settle shows us just how the town evolved from a mostly rural settlement into a lively urban centre with a busy social scene. Of course, as we mentioned, the railways have played a key part in Settle's development over the last 150 years or so. And here, we can see the bridge that still carries trains over Kirkgate in and out of Settle's railway station. The station, which we'll visit in around 10 minutes' time, transformed Settle not only by bringing in tourists from further afield for the first time, but also by reshaping the town's centuries-old agricultural and industrial sphere, and we'll talk more about that later on. Walking back up Kirkgate in the direction of the marketplace and past Victoria Hall again, however, this street is also home to a building that we mentioned just briefly a few moments ago. Opposite the mighty Victoria Hall, you'll find Settle's wonderful Quaker Meeting House, the home for the local community of Quakers from the late 17th century onwards. Now Quakers, who came to settle here around the year 1652, initially struggled to find a peaceful coexistence with the majority Anglican local population, for over 40 years being persecuted for refusing to attend Anglican church services and for refusing to pay tithes to help support the parish church of St Alkelda, just across the river in the neighbouring village of Giggleswick. Of course, these local tensions were one of the reasons that the mocking naked man insignia was placed on the house-turned-cafe in the marketplace. But here, we're looking at Spread Eagle House, a former inn that later became a home. This was once a local pub known as the Spread Eagle Inn, and as the blue plaque tells us, Thomas Proctor, a famous artist of the region, was born here in 1753. Proctor went on to study at London's Royal Academy, and produced many striking classical artworks throughout his life. But in Settle today, you might be lucky enough to spot some rather more unusual art around the town. On Kirkgate here, we find this delightful sculpture of the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz, fashioned out of flower pots. And if we spin around to look across the street, we'll also be able to see Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, also fashioned out of flower pots. So what's going on here? Have the gardeners of Settle simply become bored and decided to use their flower pots for something else? Well, not exactly. In fact, as we continue our walk around Settle, we're going to be seeing a lot more flower pot sculptures that depict all types of lovable characters and animals, from Postman Pat and his black and white cat outside the town's post office to the fat controller on the railway station platform. The reason for all these colourful characters around town is that we're here during Settle's much-loved Flower Pot Festival, a two-month-long event that sees a variety of flower pot figures pop up in pretty much every corner of the town, and which always puts a smile on the face of those strolling Settle streets. The Flower Pot Festival typically takes place through the summer holidays from early July to early September, and along with the wonderful scenery you'll be able to see on the outskirts of Settle, the flowerpot figures are arguably the most memorable feature of the delightful town centre. Still, there's striking works of art wherever you look around Settle, including this eye-catching mural at the top of Kirkgate, which was painted in 2021 and designed to pay tribute to the town's heritage through its words, and its traditional style of writing on the side of the building. Of course, once upon a time, you would have seen all manner of words and signs hand-painted onto the gable ends of houses around Settle, the town having been an important economic centre for the surrounding region. Back into the heart of town now, we're walking along Duke Street and passing by the Golden Lion, one of Settle's premier pubs and hotels, and which is an especially popular place for visitors to the town to stay before venturing out into the countryside to hike some of the surrounding hills and crags, or even to tackle the Yorkshire Three Peaks. The Three Peaks are notoriously popular as some of the highest hills in England, offering stunning views across the Yorkshire Dales, 
but the immediate vicinity around Settle is also home to a number of hills with equally fantastic vistas, most notably Castleburg Crag, which looms above the town hall and has been a popular picnic spot for locals and visitors for around 300 years now, and is only a short walk up and out of the town centre. On returning to the town centre from up on top of the crag, many locals have historically popped into the Settle Social Club here for a pint. Formerly a grand house belonging to the local gentry, this building became the local working men's club in the 20th century, and it remains in operation as one of the liveliest pubs and clubs in town. But as we make our way past the impressive frontage of the social club, formerly known as Castleburg Settle Working Men's Club, exactly what kind of work have the men of Settle historically been engaged in? Well, as one of the largest settlements in the region, Settle has for centuries been the home of a wide variety of industries. But to understand how Settle became the modern, flower-pot-filled town that we know today, we need to rewind far back in history, to the earliest origins of the town, which began around 1400 years ago. In the 7th century AD, this sparse area was settled by people known as the Angles, who had arrived on the island of Great Britain from northern Germany and southern Denmark, and they established a settlement here which they named Settle, simply meaning exactly what you'd think. Over the following couple of hundred years, the Anglian settlers were joined by Irish and Viking peoples who came to dominate the western Yorkshire Dales in the years before the arrival of William the Conqueror who then firmly established his authority over the town and the surrounding region, which was, but for a number of small settlements like this one, extremely sparse. In the years following the Battle of Hastings, local resistance in northern England to the new Norman rule led William the Conqueror to hit back with a campaign known as the Harrying of the North, designed to pummel the region into submission, and by laying waste to settlements all over. And by the end of his reign, Settle here was described in the famous Doomsday Book of 1086 simply as waste. As we know, however, by the year 1249, Settle had risen from the ashes and had begun hosting its own markets, a key step in its development that saw the first real influx of commerce and wealth to the town, establishing it as a key economic centre for the surrounding region, which is known by the name Craven and which encompasses a huge area of northwestern Yorkshire, all the way from Skipton up towards the border with Cumbria, near the town of Kirkby Lonsdale. Settle today is still well linked with Cumbria by rail, and here, as we pass by the town station's huge old water tower, the last remaining one on the line through here, we're now coming up on one of the most important spots in the whole town. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the railways transformed Settle in the 19th century, but the first local station wasn't the one that we know today, as before it, a station was built on the outskirts of the neighbouring village of Giggleswick, about a mile's walk away from the centre of Settle here, and which got the ball rolling with regards to train lines through Craven. Giggleswick Station, which still exists to this day, was opened in 1849, but Settle Station here was opened a couple of decades later in 1876, on the iconic Settle Carlisle Line. Now, although Settle and Craven have for centuries been a part of Yorkshire, the building of a line connecting this town with Carlisle, the largest city in what was then the county of Cumberland, shows us that this area was actually better linked with counties to the northwest than it was to the rest of Yorkshire. Historically, farmers in the counties of Cumberland, Westmoreland, and even parts of southwestern Scotland would herd their cattle all the way down to this area of Yorkshire for sale. But the building of a railway connecting Carlisle and Settle cut the arduous journey down to a mere two-hour trip, which brought great benefits to all sides. Cattle were then loaded onto trains in Carlisle and transported down to the village of Long Preston, just outside Settle, where butchers from industrial towns around Yorkshire and Lancashire would then purchase them at meat markets for sale at their shops. Of course, while it may have initially been a key benefit, the railways weren't solely about bringing cattle down to settle, and in the year after the first trains began arriving here, this elegant Victorian-era station was built, providing a wonderful welcome to settle for tourists. Nowadays, Settle Station, which has the appearance of a perfectly preserved heritage railway station, is a key draw for many people visiting from all over the country 
particularly railway enthusiasts who come to visit its many historic features, and also to participate in heritage railway excursions along the stunning line up to Carlisle. At the end of the platform here, meanwhile, we can see Settle's old signal box, built in 1891, and which was operational for nearly 100 years. A characteristic signal box of the old Midland Railway Company, it closed in 1984, and after being restored and relocated a little further down the platform from its original spot, it serves as a small museum that's regularly open to the public. Settle Station here is the crown jewel of heritage on the famous Settle and Carlisle Line, which runs for 72 miles between here and the county town of Cumbria along which both typical modern mainline trains operate, as well as historic steam trains offering heritage experiences. Traversing the Yorkshire Dales, the Settle and Carlisle line passes through some of the highest scenery in the entire country, and further along the line from here, it stops at Dent, the highest mainline station in England, which stands 1,150 feet above sea level, twice as high up as Settle here. There are few better ways to experience the true majesty of Britain's railways than by taking a trip on the Settle and Carlisle line. Along the way, you'll have the chance to pass through yet more gorgeous stations serving small rural communities, to gaze out at the stunning scenery of the Yorkshire Dales and towards the great peaks of the Lake District further north, and even to travel over one of the wonders of the nation's railways, the mighty Ribblehead Viaduct. Pictured here, the Ribblehead Viaduct, opened in 1875, is the longest viaduct on the entire line, stretching over 400 yards across the Great Valley, and its construction was such a significant undertaking that over 2,000 men were involved, over 100 of whom sadly lost their lives during building work. Having now made our way out of the station, and passing by the old water tower and goods yard, the Settle and Carlisle line as a whole is a true treasure of Britain's modern railways. It was the last main line in the country to be constructed primarily with manual labour, workers and navvies having established their own makeshift homes and shanty towns in settlements along the route, the traces of which can in places still be seen around the region. Nowadays, as well as the heritage trips that run from Settle to Carlisle, the line is part of a larger railway route that extends all the way down to the city of Leeds. And so the Settle and Carlisle line, which sees over a million visitors a year, is thriving like never before. But it nearly wasn't so. As we walk down Station Road back into the heart of Settle, the historic line that passes through this town was nearly closed down entirely by British Rail in the 1980s the original industrial purpose for the route having long since disappeared. However, thankfully, the local community and a number of railway enthusiasts from around the country stepped in to save the railway line, and that's why today, wonderful stations like Settle and the whole Settle Carlisle line are still in operation. Now let's leave the story of Settle's famous railway behind and return to the tale of how the old Anglian settlement grew into the town we know today. As we mentioned earlier, Settle grew into a regional centre after the beginning of markets in 1249. Now at the time, the neighbouring village of Giggleswick, with its parish church, was the central focus of the local region, and with the birth of its prestigious school in 1499, it remained highly significant, while Settle developed as an economic centre. Although this area has been settled for centuries now, you won't find many historic buildings from the medieval era with the exception of the Church of St Alkelda in Giggleswick. The reason for this is that in Settle, most houses were rather rudimentary and built of wood, which means they were regularly prone to being burned down. And that's why the houses of the 1640s we saw earlier on in our walk are among the oldest in town. If you walk around either Settle or Giggleswick, you'll notice from date markers on many houses that most of the buildings in the area date from the late 17th century, which was a period of real prosperity for the local area, long before it became the calm and attractive area that we know today. But nowadays, things are still changing in Settle, and here on the curve of Duke Street, we can see one example of how the town has adapted one of its old telephone boxes for modern use. This is Settle's delightful little listening gallery, said to be the only one of its kind in the entire world, and which is home to a small listening device that features different exhibitions throughout the year, 
and so you can pop in to hear what's going on and a story or two about the history of this wonderful town. And this isn't the only phone box that has been converted for a rather quaint new use. At the end of our walk, we'll visit another that has been turned into an art gallery, and which is thought to hold the title of the world's smallest art gallery. We'll make our way in the direction of that phone box gallery now, but here we're passing by Settle's post office, outside which we can see another flower pot figure, Postman Pat and his black and white cat. And what's Pat got in his hand, boys and girls? That's right, a letter to the former Prime Minister, though perhaps the address on the letter will need changing before Pat sends it off. Settle's flower pot figures really are a lovely addition to an already wonderful town centre, and we've still got a couple more to see on our walk as we make our way towards the phone box gallery, and the Folly, one of the largest and most famous buildings in Settle's town centre, which too was built in the late 17th century. Now like many places around the country, the late 17th century was a period of real prosperity for Settle, not only with the growth of industry, but also as England was emerging from the devastation and upheaval of the English Civil War, and the harsh period known as the Commonwealth, when Oliver Cromwell ruled the country. Interestingly, Settle had a surprising role to play during the Civil War and the Commonwealth, as it took a rather independent streak from what had been expected of it in the early years of the conflict. Initially, much of Yorkshire and the rest of Northern England was a key stronghold for the Royalists supporting King Charles I, but the landowner in Settle was actually a parliamentarian sympathiser. By 1651, when Royalist armies were still holding out even after the execution of the King, this town was then used as a base for the troops of the parliamentarian General Lambert, before the Roundheads then moved westwards towards Lancaster to face the Royalists. Passing by the town's small police station there, the development that followed the years of conflict was a time of real opportunity in Settle, and many decisions were made then that shaped the town as we know it today. For instance, in the late 18th century, plans were in place for a canal to end just a few steps away from where we are now. It would have been part of the much larger Leeds and Liverpool Canal, the second longest in England, and was intended to be used as a way to transport stone mined in North Craven here towards the industrial heartlands of England, and for coal to be transported up to this area in return. As you'll no doubt know, however, this plan never came off. But Settle and the surrounding area could have become an even larger hub of industry had the canal been built through this still highly rural part of the country. Here, meanwhile, we're looking towards another town centre pub, the Talbot Arms, which stands on the road known as High Street, on which there used to be another pub, known as the Golden Lion. You might remember that the Golden Lion was the name of the pub that we saw on Duke Street, and it moved there from the old High Street here in the 18th century as Duke Street emerged as the new main road through Settle on the route from York to Lancaster, and where most trade continues to pass to this day. The High Street, which had historically been part of the old main route through Settle, on the ancient highway from the nearby village of Long Preston, then fell into relative obscurity, but just before that change happened, the historic main road was bustling with activity, and became home to a huge new building. Here, we're approaching the Folly, the only Grade 1 listed building in all of Settle, and which dates from 1679. Built on a large scale by a wealthy local lawyer by the name of Richard Preston, the Folly was intended to showcase Settle for the powerful, modern town it was becoming at the time, and it began life simply as a house for Richard Preston and his family. From around 1708, however, the Folly began to be leased out to a long line of businesses who used it for a variety of purposes. Over time, the building has been home to everything from a fish and chip shop to a bakery, a bank, a warehouse, a furniture shop and more, as well as having had space for a few families to live inside as well. In the 1990s, however, the Building Preservation Trust of the local region bought the Folly, and it has since been converted into the Museum of North Craven Life, where you can find out even more about the history of Settle and life in the surrounding area. As I hope you'll agree from this walk, there's so much fascinating history to be discovered on the streets of Settle, which for a town of just over 2,000 people in an extremely rural area of the country is truly jammed packed with things to see and do, a truly wonderful place to visit if you're ever in the region. 
However, having passed by the folly, we're now going to make our way a short distance outside of the town centre. Because at the end of Victoria Street here, again once part of that old main road to Long Preston, we'll find the Gallery on the Green, which as we mentioned, is thought to be the smallest art gallery in the entire world. Emerging just a short distance from where we left off there on Victoria Street, we now find ourselves on the southeastern edge of Settle, on the Green, a gorgeous open space with some stunning views that's also home to that intriguingly tiny gallery. Just as we saw with the listening gallery on Duke Street, the gallery on the Green is a converted old phone box. The K6 phone box dates from 1935, but the gallery inside was opened in 2009 and ever since, the local community has continued to change and evolve the exhibitions on display inside, featuring everything from the works of famous artists to local school children, and as we have today, gorgeous images of the surrounding region and of people from the community. A wonderfully quaint feature of this already delightful Yorkshire town, the people who run the gallery on the green believe that it's the smallest art gallery in the entire world, and you'd certainly be hard pressed to find one smaller. It's also, uniquely, open 24-7 all year long, and is regularly filled to capacity at least twice a day, such is its popularity. But sadly, as we look back at the almost certainly world record holding gallery, we've now come to the end of our walk around Settle. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're looking forward to visiting Settle for yourself sometime soon.